Welcome to Illinois Lawmakers. We're back in Springfield at the Speaker's Gallery in the Illinois House, where uh, we have a new partnership with Capital News Illinois. Our guest today uh, to lead off the program is uh, former State Senator Andy Menard, who's now Deputy Governor of Illinois. Good to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me, Jack. Um, you made a lot of news last week when uh, you sent a memo to state agency directors saying that if uh, we don't have some cooperation on the revenue enhancements that the governor is asking for to build out that budget, that there may have to be some cuts. Yeah. What, uh, what is the situation now, uh, a week later, as these uh, talks move forward? Sure. Well, first, I should, I should say that the, the memo that, that we sent to agencies wasn't intended to make news. Um, I would describe it more as a continuation of what uh, the Pritzker administration has done over the last five fiscal years that has received support from the General Assembly, which is uh, balancing the budget, making sure revenues and expenditures meet, um, not do things like skip pension payments or uh, use lofty revenue estimates just to bring the budget into balance or extend the bill payment cycle. So uh, we were just simply uh, putting agencies on notice that while the governor proposed um, uh, what, what we think is a, a, a solid budget back in February, there may be some changes that are coming from the legislature and those things take time to implement. So I, I have no doubt this will come together um, in the coming uh, week or two and we will again pass now our sixth balance budget in a row. It's not unusual to have that kind of uh, word go out as things progress toward these final days of the uh, legislature's uh, spring session. It happens in Republican uh, administrations, Democrats as well. Yeah, it does. And, and you know, we, we actively manage uh, the state's budget every day of, of the year. Um, I think that's one reason why there has been uh, credit upgrade after credit upgrade, uh, why uh, the governor's work has been recognized in terms of where we are today compared to where we were just a handful of years ago. Uh, so this is just part of our effort to say, look, things may not end up the way that we proposed. Mm -hmm. And if that's the will of the legislature, if they choose to reduce spending on things um, and that is negotiated, that is that is one route. Um, I would just go back to the governor's introduced budget. Uh, we think it's a good proposal. We think it invests in the things that the people of the state want and it is balanced and it will put the, the state on uh, a better path next year. A lot of these deal with basically uh, tax code changes. Some of them, uh, it's actually continuing them. They're already uh, already in effect. Is, is there any one issue that's getting more pushback than, than others? I know the road fund transfer is one that the Republicans have mentioned. Yeah, I, I, think, I think generally, I wouldn't point to one in particular, um, but, but I would say this is a different uh, type of budget proposal than in previous years. Our revenues, uh, while the state's economy is growing, uh, it isn't growing as fast as it was a couple of years ago. Uh, we're still in a good place, but that then has an impact on the state budget. So I think the general conversation this year is just a bit different than what we've experienced in, in the last, certainly three fiscal years. So that, that requires on the administration's part different administration when it comes to budget negotiation. So, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna get this together. The governor doesn't sign budgets that are unbalanced. Um, but again, we're just making preparations uh, for final session. It, has anything been considered, um, has anything been taken off the table as far as any of these measures go? No, actually to the contrary. The governor has said that um, if the, the legislature doesn't um, you know, support one or multiple of those uh, individual pieces of his proposal, whether that's revenue or spending, that, that all ideas should be welcome and that there are, uh, there are multiple paths to get to a balanced budget that can be agreed to. One of the things that I know that he's uh, very serious about is continuing the uh, ongoing funding for the evidence-based funding formula for schools. That's what, 300 million or $350 million. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's still in there? Yes, yeah. And I think, you know, going back to, um, you know, the, the proposal this year that contains new sources of revenue, um, we should be very clear, if we're going to continue to invest in uh, the state's most underfunded schools first, which is what the evidence-based funding model uh, has been doing successfully now for many years, uh, that's going to be uh, a requirement to prioritize that in the state budget. Um, that's what the governor's introduced budget does. I think that's what the General Assembly wants to do as well. 
Deputy Governor Andy Menard, thanks very much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. You bet. Appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to start off this week's lawmakers interviews with Senate Majority Whip Christina Castro from Elgin. She's a veteran of the Illinois Senate since 2017. She also chairs the Senate Executive Committee. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, let's take a stock of where things are right now. Uh, it's barely a week to go uh, in the scheduled legislative session to the 24th. What are Senate Democrats in your caucus hearing about the budget negotiations behind the scenes? I think actually the budget negotiations are going quite well. Um, right now, individual caucuses are getting a kind of a preview of kind of like a high level preview of what's where where things stand. Right. Obviously, every member has its needs. Right. And so I think those conversations are ongoing. Actually, there's some of those conversations happening today. I'm, I'm you know, it, it's it's a tight budget. Right. Uh, we've had budgets that have been um, a little bit more plentiful. Uh, this one is going to be a little tighter, and so we are looking at ways. Um, obviously, um, the governor had his introduced budget. We're looking at that as well as looking at, you know, as, as I said on the appropriate committee, we were um, interviewing and meeting with different departments and talking about their asks. Also questioning some things where we felt there were some shortfalls to see how they plan to address them. Uh, then we'll take those conversations and then we'll start molding that budget, which is some of the things that they're happening right now. Has there been any movement on some of the revenue enhancements, the tax code changes that the governor wants to actually uh, help fund this budget? I think everything's fluid right now and I think a lot of those conversations are ongoing. Um, you know, I have one uh, bill that also adds some revenue and it's called what we call re-renters, so that way um, we generate about uh, in some states it generates as much as um, like 90 million dollars. Um, I think we were as we were kind of conservative on that so we said about I think between 30 and 50. So I, I believe that'll be part of the revenue package. Um, it's something that's been worked out uh, between um, the different stakeholders but it just captures some of that revenue and I did a lot with marketplace fairness right making sure that um, you know when you ordered online they put you there was fair share because when you look at um, equity, you know you have box stores that you know employ people, local and uh, generate money for the local economy. This is um, a kind of a loophole that's in there, and I help close that loophole. And I know that governor also has you know co closing some of the corporate tax loopholes and some of those things. And I think a lot of those proposals are very good. The uh, governor has 182 million dollars in his budget proposal to help Latin American migrants who have been shipped to Chicago to live. Uh, from places like Texas, uh, we talked. We spent pretty much all of last year talking about that. Is this uh, funding uh, pretty safe? Is, is it assured? Or I think it's. A, I mean, it, it is agreement that the governor struck with Cook County and the, and the you know city of Chicago. I, I feel pretty confident it's going to remain in there. Look, we can't have people out in the streets. We also want to transition those folks. Um, they want to have dignity. Many of them. Um, I we have actually quite a large population on the. Um, I, I say the Fred Crespo side of the district, uh, we have an influx of Venezuelan migrants who have, who have family who have, uh, who have moved into, the, into that part of my district. And we have worked uh, as well as with the local welcoming centers to make sure they have the resources they need, they're able to apply for TPS because we have businesses that want to employ them. I have many local businesses that are like, Senator, how can we help? How can we get in touch with some of these folks? Because we have needs, we have jobs um, that are, and they're desperate for it. So I think there's an opportunity for us to continue to help and to get them acclimated into the state. I know that one of the big issues you've been working on this year is the Dignity uh, in Pay Act, and this deals with uh, the subminimum wage that a lot of people with disabilities have been earning going back, what, to like late 1930s, and you're trying to move that back up over a period of time so that they'll be getting at least minimum wage. Yeah, so that's a little personal for me, and my late mother had a friend um, whose daughter was is disabled, and she actually worked for one of these uh, facilities, and she would come home after two weeks, after working eight hours, assembling something, whatever, whatever product they had brought into the shop, and she would come home with a 50 cent check. And I mean, it's just deplorable to me. She would complain about, hey, they would, you know, my, my daughter is doing all this arduous labor. I'd like to see her get paid for it properly, like 
a normal person. And so one of the things that when this bill, Theresa Ma, Representative Theresa Ma and I had this bill in 18, and we, we began conversations. Um, but we have noticed other states have begun to phase this out. This is a five-year phase out. I understand the Department of Human Services and the different groups are still negotiating. I got an update yesterday that they're trying to strike a deal on a few other things, but we're, we're working on that. Well, we hope to find out more about that in the next few days. Senator Castro, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Illinois Lawmakers continues now with Assistant Senate Republican Leader Steve McClure of Springfield. Senator McClure is former prosecutor who served in the Illinois Senate since 2019. Good to have you back on the program and see you in person for a change. Yeah, good to be back, Jack. Um, I'm sure it's everyone's guess at this point as we tick down, a clock ticks down to May 24th, which is the scheduled adjournment as to what the Democrats are doing with the governor's budget. They've had some problems coming together, a meeting of the minds on exactly how they're going to pay for the governor's budget request. What are the Senate Republicans hearing? We're just hearing the discussions are ongoing. We're trying to be involved with the discussions. We've got some folks that we've determined should be our budget leaders. Chapin Rose is our main senator on that. And so Chapin is trying to be involved as much as possible. And we're optimistic that we're gonna have some influence over the budget, but it's too early to tell at this moment. It has been, at least in the last couple of years, there seems to have been more Republican input on the budget, at least on the Senate side. Yeah, I mean, I, the Senate president was coming in to meet with uh, Senator Curran uh, up to the very last moment before we vote on the budget. So I give President Harmon great credit for that. It's just unfortunate that at the end of the day, we couldn't reach a deal. As you look at uh, the things that you wanna see in the budget for your district and overall for the state of Illinois, what would be some of the top priorities for the Senate Republicans? Well, I would say one of the issues that we dealt with during the budget process was the Invest in Kids program. And we've got all these kids from lower income households that were getting these scholarships and staying in their schools. Uh, now all of a sudden they've been kicked out of these schools and I think that program should be looked at and uh, that's a big issue for all of us and certainly uh, crime is still a major issue and certainly the drug problem that we've got in our state's a major issue and those go hand in hand. So funding to help people get on a better path and to fight uh, crime I think is a big, those are two big issues. One of the things I always like to do on the program is from time to time focus on bills that individual lawmakers come up with and um, where they come from, the ideas where you get them from constituents or various things. One of the bills that uh, has passed the Senate it has to do with that terrible tragedy in Effingham County last year near Teutopolis involving an, uh, the anhydrous ammonia truck. Tell us about that. Yes, so that was a horrific accident where we had several people die, several people injured, people had to evacuate the area, and I've never seen anything like that before. And so uh, after that horrific accident, I had some folks from Effingham County come to me and say, look, younger drivers in particular need to know what is out there on the roads and the fact that you can have a fender bender with a vehicle that is containing hazardous materials, and that could be a severely deadly crash. And so uh, for that reason, I filed a bill that would, that will, if it passes the House, it's in the House now, um, that will make it so that in the rules of the road book that the Secretary of State produces, uh, there has to be a instruction on these hazardous material placards that these trucks would have before they uh, carry these materials. And if it's in the rules of the road book, it also gets taught in driver's ed classes. And so I think People just need to know how serious it is when you get into these crashes, especially with these vehicles with these hazardous materials. There's another one that's passed the Senate that deals with uh, the Department of Children and Family Services and kids who may be removed from a household because of abuse and other issues and where they might be able to continue uh, to go to school. Can you uh, give us some insights into what your thinking is? Yes, so there is a horrific case where I have a student in my district who was getting sexually assaulted by their parent. And DCFS got involved after the student made these allegations against the parent and said, okay, um, we're not going to need to take you into our custody as long as you go live with your other parent. And if the child had been placed with a foster parent, they would have continued to be able to go to their same school and there would not have been any interruption for that student's education. Unfortunately, um, the way that it works, if a, uh, a, a person, a student goes from one parent into the house to love the other parent, that does not trigger the foster parent rule as far as 
continue in this, the, go, to go to the same school. And so, unfortunately, because of the allegations that this student made, uh, they couldn't go back to their same school district. And so they lost all their friends, all their teachers, et cetera. And it just didn't seem right to me that you punish a student for reporting horrific abuse. And it's bad enough that the student's going through this abuse, let alone having to go all over the place with their school. So this bill makes it so that they can, they can remain at their school, even if it's going from one parent to the other parent because of allegations of abuse or neglect. As we wrap up on this, uh, is, what's the, is there an immediate uh, effective date on that if it passes the House? I believe it would take effect uh, at the end of the year. Senator McClure, thanks very much for your time. We certainly appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Legislation is on its way to Governor J.B. Pritzker's desk that would create a new Department of Early Childhood Agency, sort of a clearinghouse for services focusing on early childhood development. Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers is the chief sponsor of the bill in the House, Democratic State Representative Mary Beth Canty of Arlington Heights. Good to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. Let's start at the beginning. How did you get involved in this effort? I know from covering the governor over the years, this has been a passion of his for decades. Oh yeah, he is very into early childhood, helping families. It's a strong passion of mine. I'm a mom of two, so I understand these systems. Um, but I had actually had an idea of wanting to move daycare licensing, and I wrote it on a sticky note, and then heard the announcement last year that the governor wanted to stand up this new agency, and I said right away, I want a seat at the table. I want to be part of this effort. Were you reading my mind that I wanted to do this exact thing? He signed an executive order to that effect, I believe, earlier uh, last year, kind of setting the stage for this. So what all went into the creation of the new department? You're actually picking uh, areas off from other agencies, programs that already exist. Right, so we're taking programs from ISBE, DHS, and um, DCFS and pulling them forward. The ones that focus on early childhood specifically to hopefully streamline things for families across the state. They focus on early intervention, pre-K for all, home visiting, so really covering birth all the way up through pre-K. And the idea behind a lot of this is to make sure that kids are ready for school, ready to learn when it's time for them to get into pre-K and kindergarten and beyond. Correct, and it'll also help their parents and caregivers have the supports that they need. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that it addresses is early childhood block grants for preschools. That's currently under the State Board of Education. How would this be administered? So we're not fundamentally with this legislation changing the programs themselves. So they will move over. What we're gonna do over the next two years is study these programs and figure out where can we find efficiencies, common ground, and streamline these efforts so that on July 1, 2026, there is no gap in services or uh, anything to providers and to families. You alluded to this a little earlier, but it also deals with uh, programs from the Department of Human Services like subsidized child care, home visits, early childhood uh, care inter interventions as well? Right. Yes, it absolutely does. And similarly, we'll be studying all of those programs to make sure that we're getting the best into the new agency. If a system is not currently working, it doesn't make sense to keep it the way it is, but it will be studied, moved over, so that on July 1, 2026, we're ready to move forward. And going back to the Department of Children and Family Services, they're the ones who license daycares throughout the entire state of Illinois. How would this work better under this new arrangement? I think what we're seeing right now are different standards across the board. DCFS has a lot on its plate. So by bringing that piece of their work, that program under this new department, will make it easier for them to have one system that works across the board. Um, families tell me that there's an awful lot of bureaucratic hurdles that they have to face when they're wa wor working across agencies from one department to another. Um, how would this improve um, their ability to cut red tape across the board? I think because these programs are currently spread across so many agencies, there's a lot of duplication of efforts, duplication of forms, et cetera, and the agencies don't necessarily talk to each other very well. So again, by housing them in one place, you can have someone that can help you navigate and start working all the way across the board in a streamlined fashion. 
There was broad bipartisan support for this bill. Uh, it passed the Senate 56 to nothing, cleared the House by a vote of 93 to 18. There was some Republican pushback, though, during last week's uh, floor debate, uh, wondering about the Pritzker administration's ability to actually nail down a hard dollar figure on how much this new agency is going to cost per year. Is that a concern as far as you're concerned? It's not truly a concern that I have. I think we always need to be mindful of staying on the fiscal path that we are on. We are on a great fiscal path in this state and have been for the last five, six, seven years. And what I think we need to pay attention to is that we are going to be moving these programs. I think we'll see that play out in the agencies themselves, the three that remain and the new one. You'll see some shifting across the way there. We've got about 30 seconds left. The one question I have is, uh, this is being phased in over a couple of years. How are you going to determine the metrics that make sure that this is actually working? I've been working very closely with the governor's team and their transition director, Ann Whalen, through this whole process. I intend to keep doing that. As a legislator, I think it's my job to follow my legislation all the way through to implementation. Representative Canty, thanks so much for your time on Lawmakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next on Illinois Lawmakers, a conversation with State Representative Bill Hodder of Morton. Uh, Dr. Hodder is one of several state lawmakers whose districts are being impacted by the Pritzker administration's decision to tear down some old prisons and rebuild them. Uh, in your situation, it's the uh, Logan Correctional Center in, in Lincoln. Give us the background on that. So Logan Correctional Center is the largest multi-level security women's prison in Illinois. In fact, there's only one other smaller one that's, that's minimum security uh, women's prison in Illinois. So it's been around for a long time and it is in need of repair. There's no question it's in need of repair and we admit that, but we've had years of neglect and deferred maintenance and we knew the intentions were to uh, basically not do any kind of repair or maintenance to Logan Correctional Center and uh, then demolish it or renovate it at some later time. Well, the time is now and it was announced that they would demolish and rebuild Logan Correctional Center. Well, that was very confusing because when they say it's, we're gonna demolish and rebuild Logan Correctional Center, we all agree to that. But what they uh, were referring to, they were gonna demolish and then build somewhere Logan Correctional Center. Well, we found out that it's at Stateville. And what was the administration's rationale, their consultant's uh, rationale for, re for moving it uh, and rebuilding there? Well, you know, they've, it's been a moving target really, Jack. It, you know, we, we've asked them that, and at first it was, well, we need, a, uh, we need a, a location that's closer to the population center. And, uh, and then they said, well, uh, you, have a, you have a women's prison that's close by, but it's, it's a, a smaller and minimum security. So uh, then it was, uh, well, th there's a more diverse workforce up in Will County. And, um, and then they said, well, there's, there's a better offering of programs, both vocational and, and educational programs. With respect to the actual facility, how many uh, residents does it uh, house? Almost a thousand inmates. Almost yeah. a thousand. And what is the current workforce there? About 500, and a lot of those are union jobs. I mean, most of them are union jobs. It is a huge economic driver for Logan County, and the impact of a closure and a, and and uh, you know losing it to the Stateville location is just humongous. It's a massive impact. We think it's over 61 million dollars of economic impact to Logan County, and it's not just Logan County, it's uh, Macon County, it's Sangamon County, and, and many of the reps in the surrounding districts will be affected by this. There's an old saying that for every dollar that's spent in a local community, it probably changes hands six times, so that's what you're talking yes. about. Um, do they have a, a time frame at this point for actually uh, phasing out Logan and possibly rebuilding? Yeah, it's, that's known only to them, but there is a COGVA, a time frame for public comment and that has to be by law by statute it has to be in a certain amount of time so we look forward to the next few weeks that being scheduled where our constituents can have a say and and give their arguments as well 
Well, you've been built, you've been building up a grassroots movement. We were talking about that just a little bit before we went on the air. You had a, a Facebook meeting last night or a Zoom meeting last night with a lot of the concerned officials, including Senator Turner and the other lawmakers. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it was a good event last night. We had uh, a large online, uh, Facebook online event, and then we have a Facebook page, and then we have the, you know, the constant in contact with the Department of Corrections and the governor's office. But we really look forward to public comments where people can be in person with the administration and the Department of Corrections and really give their opinions in, in the last minute or so that we have, the Committee on Government Forecasting and Accountability has till what, mid-June to make a recommendation on this, yes. so you're kind of under the gun at the moment. Yeah, and, and that recommendation is, is just a recommendation. And, you know, we realize that this is a very political process. We have our arguments, we have great arguments, not only the impact, but the ecosystem is there, the infrastructure is there, the land is there, the cost of living is lower, the cost of rebuilding is lower, the cost of labor is lower. It's a central location. Uh, I mean, there's so many arguments, but it comes down to politics. And CAGPA, as you know, is made up of politicians. Indeed it is. Representative Howder, thank you very much for thank your time you so on Illinois Graham. Lawmakers. Really appreciate it. Joining me now on Illinois Lawmakers, Hannah Meisel of Capital News Illinois. Hannah, great to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me. You've been covering the State House for a long time now. Are, are you surprised at all that we don't know more any than we do at the moment about where this budget is going as far as the majority, super majority Democrats are headed? No, not at all. I mean, I have been covering this since 2014 and I think that is the last session we saw a normal end of session and normal, of course, very subjective. Um, almost every year in recent years, we've gone over time, um, it, you know, whether by a few hours, six in the morning a few years ago, a few days in 2019 during the governor's first budget year. Um, so no, I'm not surprised. I would say, you know, it goes to show that just because you have supermajority Democrats doesn't mean that you're all aligned. 78 in the House, is a huge number, that's a lot of cats to herd. They all have different sorts of priorities. Uh, one Democrat is does not represent the next Democrat. Right, it's not monolithic by any by any standards. And there's uh, there are a lot of interests at the table. Predictions are talking about trying to get out of here on May the 24th, ahead of the Memorial Day weekend. But really the, the, the crucial deadline is May 31st. That's right, May 31st. After that, um, we increase the th thresholds for which you know you would have to uh, get the votes to have an immediate effective date on things like the budget. That's crucially important. Um, but even if you don't have, you know, the budget, it's very possible that we could go into June. I think it's not ideal, but if we did, um, you know, you would still have the three-fifths majority that you would need. You'd have the 71 votes in the House out of the 78. I think it would still be done. Not ideal, though. And on myself, thanks so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. We appreciate it. Thank you.